Last month, the United States successfully tested a scramjet-powered hypersonic cruise missile. And unlike the Kinzel that Russia recently used in Ukraine, this weapon was the real deal. Now, hypersonic weapons are new weapons that can travel at speeds faster than Mach 5, but it's really their maneuverability that makes them special. Let's dive into America's latest hypersonic cruise missile test. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. Now, we discussed previously how Russia's KH-47 M2 Kinzel is technically hypersonic in the same way all ballistic missiles are. It's really an air-launched ballistic missile based on Russia's 9K-720 Iskander short-range ballistic missile that started development all the way back in 1988. Russia's Kinzel saw its operational debut in Ukraine last month. In fact, they used one twice, one day after another. But because Ukraine has limited air defense capabilities, the reasons behind them using Kinzel are still a bit of a mystery. It may have been about sending a nuclear message to NATO about Russia's hypersonic capabilities, or it may have been a distraction because their military performance has been so poor in Ukraine to date. In any case, while Russia was using its faux hypersonic Kinzel against the Ukrainian people, the United States was secretly testing a new iteration of their hypersonic air-breathing weapon concept, or HAWK, as many of us have come to call it. Now, development on this specific iteration of the Hawk missile has been a joint effort, led by DARPA, or the Defense Advanced Research Laboratory, along with the Air Force Research Laboratory, Aerojet Rocketdyne, and Lockheed Martin. In fact, the scramjet itself used in this missile is a Lockheed Martin design. And as luck would have it, I had the opportunity to speak to Eric Scherf and Dave Bergenini over at Lockheed Martin about their hypersonic programs earlier this year. These guys both have big, impressive titles, so bear with me as I get through them. Eric Scherf is the vice president of hypersonic strike programs at Lockheed Martin Space, and Dave Bergenini is the vice president of hypersonic and strike systems at Lockheed Martin Missiles and Fire Control. I'll start with a quote from Eric Scherf that sort of explains why hypersonic weapons have become all the rage in recent years. Hypersonic systems provide a combination of speed, maneuverability, and operating altitude that enables highly survivable long-range capability for the rapid defeat of time-critical, heavily defended, and high-value targets. Now, something that's really important to note about this recent test is that it's the second successful test for the DARPA-led Hawk missile effort, but it was the first using a Lockheed Martin-sourced scramjet propulsion system. The last successful test was actually of a Raytheon-built Hawk missile powered by a Northrop Grumman-sourced scramjet. Now, what that really means is that the United States now has two working scramjet designs for missile applications, and that's a pretty big deal, because although scramjet technology has been the subject of study for literally decades, and there have been plenty of scramjet technology demonstrators over the years, no nation has ever fielded an operational scramjet in a weapon or a vehicle of any kind. Now, scramjets, or supersonic combustion ramjets, are sort of the next generation of ramjet technology that allows combustion to take place with air flowing through the engine at supersonic speeds. Now, where a normal jet engine uses a compressor section with fan blades to compress air prior to combustion, a ramjet actually uses the pressure of the air flowing into the engine for compression. And a scramjet works in a similar capacity, except ramjet technology uses a cone to slow the speed of the air flowing into the engine to subsonic speeds to make it more manageable for combustion. A scramjet, on the other hand, allows the air to travel through the engine at supersonic speeds. And as you might imagine, it's really tough to ignite an air-fuel mixture when the air is moving at Mach speed. Earlier this year, I spoke to Dr. Joseph Jewell, who's an assistant professor at Purdue University's School of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and he also happened to spend five years at the U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory's hypersonic sciences branch. And he had probably the best description I've ever heard for what makes scramjets so tough. He likened scramjet combustion to trying to keep a lighter lit in a hurricane. 
Now, other than this advanced scramjet propulsion system allowing for incredibly high speeds, the Hawk would travel just like any other traditional cruise missile, or really aircraft for that matter. In a way, you can sort of think of cruise missiles as suicide drones. They fly a lot like airplanes, along a pretty horizontal flight path, with the ability to maneuver to avoid being intercepted. We don't know exactly where the test was conducted, but it was somewhere off the west coast, and the missile was initially powered by a conventional rocket booster, as is often the case with scramjets, because they just don't work very well at lower speeds. Now, there are no available figures for the Hawk's top speed or range, but reports from Lockheed Martin and DARPA both indicate that this recent test was conducted at moderate hypersonic speeds, which means probably just above Mach 5. The missile flew at an altitude higher than 65,000 feet and traveled a reported 300 miles. Now, at these speeds, that means it probably only needed to be flying for about five minutes. Now, this test is of particular import, because with all the talk about the United States losing the hypersonic arms race, this scramjet test means the U.S. has now had more successes than failures when it comes to testing hypersonic cruise missiles. Now, hypersonic cruise missiles are different than the hypersonic boost glide vehicles that both Russia and China have in service. Hypersonic boost glide vehicles aren't all that different from the warheads on traditional long-range ballistic missiles, at least in the early stages of their flight path. They're carried into the upper atmosphere via high-velocity rocket boosters, just like an ICBM, but usually to a lower altitude. The missile then deploys one or more glider vehicles that rely on momentum and control surfaces or maneuvering thrusters to manage their high-speed gliding descent as they close with their targets. Now, to date, these are the only types of hypersonic weapons anyone has in service. Russia's avant-garde hypersonic boost glide vehicle is a nuclear weapon meant to be carried aboard their RS-28 Sarmat, a new ICBM that should enter service later this year. China's DFZF is an anti-ship weapon carried aboard their DF-17 ballistic missile. Hypersonic cruise missiles like America's recent Hawk test fall into a completely different technological category. They're really only lumped together because they move very fast and can maneuver in flight. Now, America's real secret weapon in the hypersonic arms race is, you guessed it, a whole bunch of money. America has over 70 hypersonic weapons programs in various stages of development, with a number of parallel efforts in both boost glide vehicles and scramjet-powered cruise missiles. But America's efforts have been pretty slow going and, honestly, rife with failure. Out of 17 total hypersonic weapons tests conducted over the past 12 or so years, 10 have been either partial or complete failures. But it's important to remember that a lot of the failures associated with scramjet efforts haven't been about the scramjet at all, but rather technical difficulties with unrelated supporting systems. By my count, this is the eighth time the United States has tested a hypersonic scramjet-powered cruise missile. And of those eight tests, three were failures. But two of those failures were because of either the conventional rocket booster failing to fire or a control fin on the missile failing to function. Only once out of those eight tests, from what I've been able to determine, did the scramjet itself fail. And now we know that the last successful Hawk test launch, which took place last fall, was of a Northrop Grumman scramjet, and this most recent success in March was from a Lockheed Martin scramjet design. Now, depending on how much stock you put in Russian claims about their own weapons testing apparatus, this really may mean that the U.S. is now leading the way when it comes to scramjet-powered hypersonic cruise missiles. And to be honest, that's in keeping with assessments that I keep hearing from experts and that we've discussed on this channel before. The hypersonic arms race you see in the media isn't real. It's all about who can claim to have these weapons operational first. The real arms race that's going on right now is all about who can field new capabilities that offer genuine strategic value. And in that regard, to be honest, China is in the lead with their hypersonic boost glide anti-ship weapons. But with this development in the U.S.'s efforts to field scramjet-powered hypersonic cruise missiles, they may not keep that lead for long. But I can already hear people in the comment section screaming about Russia's 3M22 Zircon scramjet-powered hypersonic cruise missile, which, according to them, they have tested repeatedly and were practically done with testing by the fall of 2021. 
The problem with Zircon is that all we have to go on when it comes to whether or not this system works is Russia basically just saying that it does. Now, I understand that that's not all that different than just trusting press releases from Lockheed Martin or DARPA, but the truth is, it's very different. You have to consider historical precedent and the media environment of these two nations. Russia has a long history of exaggerating military capabilities to garner media attention. And Russian state media controls the messaging both domestically and internationally. There is no free press in Russia to hold them accountable for their claims. The United States has been pretty open about its failures. I could read a list of them for you right now. You won't find that same sort of transparency coming from Russia or China. And it's because of that history of transparency and public accountability that I tend to trust announcements made in U.S. media or by U.S. agencies much more than I trust announcements made by the Kremlin or the Chinese government. For all of the egregious failings in American media, it is still free. You'll find lots of stories right now about the F-35 program being a failure, but you won't find any in Russian media about the Su-57 being garbage, and you won't find any in Chinese media about the J-20 not living up to expectations either. This isn't because the F-35 is much worse than these jets, it's because in America we get to talk about what our government is spending our money on, and even complain when we don't like how they're doing it. But skepticism is a good thing. After all, the U.S. has gotten beat up in the press over the past few years for losing this hypersonic race, so there's certainly incentive for exaggerating or even lying about successes. So I'll leave it up to you. I tend not to trust Russia's assessments of its own military capabilities because I've watched them lie so frequently and egregiously about it. But maybe their 3M22 Zircon is the exception. If that's the case, Russia may well put their hypersonic scramjet-powered cruise missile into service before the U.S. manages to get its own. Especially because Russia really hurries to put things into service. I mean, the Kinzel entered service after just two tests. And maybe it's even fair to call me out for some bias here, because despite spending years studying defense technology, and in particular, Russian defense technology, I am, after all, a veteran of the U.S. military. I left the United States Marine Corps as a sergeant. So whether you trust Russia's statements about Zircon or DARPA's statements about Hawk, only time will really tell. But there's one thing I know for sure. The idea that the United States is losing the hypersonic arms race isn't all it's cracked up to be. And while nations like Russia may claim to field weapons first, it's really about whether or not they'll work. But to be honest, here's hoping we never have to find out in combat. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.